we've been given the the, uh, the nod from the director over there, so we might get underway. Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to, to Greenway. Um, the purpose of today's talk is to explore a few issues about how cases are run and whether or not we can do it in a more cost-effective way and a more efficient way for the benefit of our clients and ourselves, our sanity. Um, so uh, we're going to do this as a sort of a panel session and if you've got anything to say or any questions or comments, um, feel free to interrupt us as we go. Um, oh, it works. So we both practice in the area of construction and I assume that many people here tonight and watching uh, also do, but the same applies, what we have to say tonight applies equally to con commercial cases. Any, any litigation that involves a lot of documents and construction cases, as you know, are very document intensive, but they inevitably involve a, a lot of documents and therefore high costs. Um, if you can manage the documents, you'll get on top of the costs of litigation. And so what we're trying to do tonight is to explore ways, as I said, of doing um, a lot of the document uh, intensive uh, tasks involved in litigation more efficiently and cost effectively. Um, we don't have a free hand with the way in which we run these cases. We, we're all bound by the rules and the practice notes and directions and so on. But there's, there is still some scope within that uh, for us all to look for better ways of doing things and always analyse how we've just run a case and see, ask ourselves whether we could do it better. Um, it's always good to sort of self-assess at the end of any sort of case like that. So um, when you are um, preparing a case, there are a number of steps throughout the life of, of litigation. Each of those steps, whether they're requirements of the rules or the, or the directions and so on, each of those things that we're required to do um, are a means to an end. They're not uh, the goal itself. They are all designed to get us to a hearing in the best uh, way, in the most efficient way and, and cost-effective way, but also armed with the best evidence and the best tools and all, in all, in all, uh, to allow us to run the case and hopefully win the case. Uh, there are probably four um, main points in a case that are high-intensity document moments, if I can call them that. And they are uh, those on the screen. So at the outset, when your client turns up and upends a box of documents on your desk, many of which are irrelevant, you've got to go through the documents, see what's there and collate what's relevant and what's going to help you try and understand the instructions and put together some form of document bundle that will help you analyse the case. And you'll start from that moment to develop a case theory based on the documents you've been given. So that involves um, collating them in a way that's user-friendly, that's going to help you down the track. The next uh, point is when you start preparing the evidence. You're getting all those documents that you've previously been given and putting them in a form that's going to tell the story uh, to the court in due course, um, hopefully to get your case across the line. Obviously you've got disclosure or discovery as it was once called. Um, and then ultimately you've got the documents that you need to put together when you prepare the case for the hearing at the business end of the, of the proceedings. Um, and they are normally the things that you're required to do as part of a practice note of the rules and so on. So those, um, those rules uh, that, or sorry, those, those steps are all, uh, they, they've got a historical basis, but they're all designed so that you can get a case distilled from what is probably a difficult to understand um, story given to you by a client into a form that will fit in with a, a cause of action and allow you to develop the case so that you can put your client in the best possible position to win the case. Now, there are two um, of those steps that we want to focus on tonight because they're the steps that we think solicitors and counsel work together collaboratively to, um, to try and put together the case. And they are the preparing for the evidence, pre sorry, preparing the evidence and preparing the documents for the hearing. Now, like all good jokes, you've got to start with the punchline and work your way back and try and get there and see how, how what, what is the best way of getting there. So when you get to the business end of the case, the court's going to make you do a number of things. And one of the things that you, you all probably know you have to do is to prepare a court book. Um, the court book will include a number of components. Well, one of those components, and 
Without question, the most important thing you will do throughout the life of litigation is the preparation of a chronological bundle. Now, that That is, you know, if there, if there is only one thing you can do in litigation, that's the thing you, you ought to be focusing on because that is always the best evidence, the made up of documents that were created at the time, the most reliable way to tell the story by reference to those direct documents. Now, Richard and I um, and many other people, we deal with electronic briefs, we've sort of moved away from paper and we, we don't do a lot of, I, don't, I take, don't take paper to court at all, I think I've taken a piece of paper to court for about four years and I think Richard's much the same. But tonight isn't about trying to persuade you to abandon paper and, and, and adopt a paperless practice and only deal with electronic documents. What we have to say tonight and the, and the suggestions we're going to put to you will apply equally to uh, those of you who prefer paper, just print whatever is necessary to print, and those of you who would prefer to deal with these things electronically. Um, you probably need to keep in mind, though, that a change from paper to electronic um, litigation is inevitable and it's probably, if not already there, in many respects. I'm aware of some insurers, anecdotally, who won't permit their solicitors to brief counsel who won't take an electronic brief, for example. So the change is, is there, it's coming, and I think we need to at some point get on top of it. But I'm, as I said, tonight isn't to say to you, you know, abandon paper, pick up the iPad and go, go for it. Tonight is just about trying to develop um, and explore ways of doing these things more um, cost effectively and, um, and efficiently. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to pass over to Richard. We've got a few different areas we're each going to deal with, and I'll come back and talk to you in a moment. But Richard's going to look at the way that we currently do it to demonstrate why there is an obvious better way of doing it, we think. This will probably be familiar to most of us here that um, that is the way it's commonly done at the moment. But as Ian flagged, I think we think the two most important document moments for... Uh, the collaborative effort that the, that the solicitors and barristers should be involved in is preparing the evidence, obviously enough, and preparing the bundle for hearing. And as to, the, to preparing the evidence, um, the usual course sees each week to swear an affidavit. Each affidavit usually exhibits a bundle of uh, documents and then the exhibit includes all the documents that are relevant to that witness's evidence. But the problem starts to emerge when, uh, as is the usual case, the next witness comes along and um, wants to swear an affidavit and referring to and the next thing we're exhibiting many of the same documents as witness one uh, prepared and sometimes a witness will swear more than one affidavit with, uh, with each one of those affidavits having its own exhibit and, and we're all familiar with the problem that often happens where, where witnesses are referring to the same documents and that means that um, Frequently, the documents are large, and sorry, let me go back. and particularly in construction cases, and um, it becomes a complete bogus muddle when you've got you've got uh, the same document appearing multiple times in in affidavits. So I, I had a case I think last year involving a hydraulic performance on a, a site, um, you know, stormwater and drainage and the like, and the hydraulic space appeared five times in the and it was 120 pages, and the same space appeared. No fewer than five times in the court book, and the judge wasn't all that thrilled with us. Um, the second step after the evidence has all been served, of course, is preparing the hearing bundle um, for court. Um, and this is where the practice note already in its present form dictates um, what's required in the preparation of a court book. We're probably we're coming to look at that practice note in a moment, but obviously enough, the purpose of the court book is to bundle the relevant documents into one place, accessible to everybody who's involved in the hearing. And usually those documents involve the pleadings, um, the, the evidence, uh, the expert reports, and um, including the joint reports, and any other documents that are going to be put before the judge. Um, and the practice note already requires that uh, the court book include a chronological bundle of the documents to be relied on the trial, and I think as Ian flagged, that's probably more on it in the breach. <laughs> um, 
but nevertheless, that, that, that is what the practice note presently requires. And the parties are, um, in getting to this stage of proceeding, have usually spent the GDP of a small island nation to prepare affidavits and exhibits. And it seems to us that there's, there's two options at that point for preparing the court book, either bundling up all the existing affidavits and separate exhibits with all their duplication, uh, or alternatively pulling the exhibits apart, pulling, pulling, putting the documents into chronological order and uh, eliminating duplication in that process. The first option of simply bundling everything up that's already been served is um, probably less expensive, although it's still not cheap, and it's um, contrary to the practice note. And it's also <laughs> next to useless uh, doing it that way, we think. The second option, um, which involves pulling the exhibits apart and um, putting them into chronological order is, again, very time consuming, again, expensive. Um, and it often we've found res results in the court book finding its way to chambers on a Friday night before the Monday start, when you're really keen to have had the paginated set to prepare for the case. And a lot of, a lot of time on the weekend before the trial was spent transposing uh, previous exhibit references to the, to the new freshly fresh pagination in the court book. Um, and the, the, the last uh, feature of the present system we think that's un, undesirable is the fact that because it's um, agony to try to have to remove the du duplication, often it doesn't happen and the court book finishes up with the five copies of the hydraulics best that happened in that matter last year. Uh, so uh, we think we might have a better way through it and um, I think Ian's going to uh, talk about that for a moment. I know. Well, given we're both construction lawyers, to use a construction analogy, the court book is like the toolbox that you take to to the hearing, and you've got to turn up to the, the hearing with the, the right tools, sharp tools, um, you know, the, the ones that are really going to get, get the job done. Now, um, if we just return to the punchline again for the moment, that's what the aim is, all the steps that you, you undertake throughout the life of the case, and particularly putting together the, the hearing bundle, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to put together a, a chronological bundle and a hearing bundle or court book, whatever you want to call it, that is able to best equip you and us to run the case in the interests of the client to achieve the best outcome. That's what you're aiming for. So that the chronological bundle is not just a requirement of the practice note. It's something that we all need and all um, will use throughout the hearing. And it's important to um, ensure that it achieves that purpose. So one thing that is important which is, uh, Richard mentioned the, the, the problems associated with getting the freshly paginated court book on Friday night before a Monday trial starting when we've spent weeks, possibly more, and you have spent weeks, everyone has been poring over exhibits and writing notes on the documents and putting references into submissions and so on and suddenly all their all that work is redundant in a way because you've got to start with new with a new bundle that's differently ordered and so on. No doubt has all the duplications that were in the exhibits and so on, but still only references is going to work. And for people like well Rich and I use an app called Liquid Text and so we have hyperlinks throughout the documents. They're now useless because we've got to do it again with a new bundle. So the the late production of the court book is a real problem. But it also compromises your ability to do the best job for your client. So the earlier you produce it, the better it will be. And the answer to how you do that is really in the practice note. And as Richard said, it's more often ordered in the breach. The practice note, um, the relevant parts of it, uh, we're going to focus on a paragraphs 33 to 39. 33 is not all that controversial. Um, that deals with uh, whether to file or just serve. 34, again, re deals with interlocutory applications. But this is, this is the engine room of it. 35 and 36 are really important, we think. So the former practice of annexing or exhibiting documents to affidavits or statements will only be permitted in interlocutory applications and otherwise with the leave of the court or pursuant to agreement between the parties. And 36, in the preparation of the evidence to rely on a trial, any document referred to in any statement or affidavit are to be placed in the proposed court book in chronological order. Now, um, 
if we so let's just go through the rest of that so, so subject to an order of the court unless otherwise agreed between the parties the court book is to be established in electronic form as i said we're not here to persuade you to adopt paperless um, litigation you can put it in electronic form and print it at any time if that's what your preference is and then 38 and this is critical. What I'm going to say a little later on is the importance, talk about the importance of getting all this right at the outset, not waiting until things have moved on uh, to a point where it becomes prohibitively expensive to try and retrofit what the rules require, the practice note requires, to an already existing bundle of affidavits and exhibits. So 38 requires the that prior to the preparation of the timetable for the serving of evidence, parties have to agree on the manner in which the electronic form of court book, the electronic court book, is to be established, including where it is to be established, which party parties or third party will manage it, its format. Such agreement should be recorded in short minutes of order for the preparation of the evidence in the proceedings. Now, Richard will deal in due course with um, a proposal to achieve that last bit, the short minutes. And then electronic court book should be produced at trial, a hard copy of only for those parts that will be essential for the court to consider in determining the dispute. Now, let's just go back to 35 and 36. So what, what that effectively means is this, the way we see that. So 37 to 39 really go, they provide how, how those two outcomes are to be achieved. And, and it's clear from what you remember what I said at the outset, what we're trying to do is look at the way in which these steps will give us the best chance of success at a trial. And these, these steps that are embodied in the practice note are clearly designed to get us to a point at the hearing, to put us in a, in a position where we are able to best run the, the, the case on behalf of the client. Now, what is involved in this process is something along these lines. You, you have a plaintiff who serves its evidence and it does that together with a bundle of documents. As I said at the outset, you will have a bundle of documents that the client will have given you. You will have distilled out the, irrele the relevant documents, produced a chronological bundle for your own benefit so you can probably advise your client. It's nothing new. When you serve your evidence, the affidavits will refer to this common bundle. The defendant then serves their evidence, and rather than produce their own exhibits, they just add to the bundle. They supplement the bundle with another, well, the, whatever documents they want to add to it. Now, that way, that immediately, if, if witness A refers to the contract, witnesses B through to T don't have to exhibit the same contract over and over again. And as you know, contracts in construction cases, in most commercial cases as well, are huge. I mean, they involve an, an enormous amount of paperwork. So. The, doc, the contract, for example, and relevant documents such as the specifications that Richard was talking about, they're already in there. So the, the subsequent witnesses, when they come along and prepare their affidavits, whether they be the, the plaintiff's additional witnesses or whether they be the defendants when it's their, their turn to prepare their evidence, simply supplement the existing bundle in electronic form that's built up in, in chronological order. Similarly, cross-defendants come along and so on and they put on their evidence, serve their affidavits, add to the bundle, update the index, and, and then you go on. So when you do it that way, um, by uh, as an incident of the as an incident of the preparation of your affidavits, you automatically produce a chronological bundle. You haven't done any more work. You just produced it on the way through. You get to the end of the process and you've got a bundle that you can either print or just keep in electronic form. You don't have to pull apart affidavits, you don't have to pull apart exhibits, no work involved. It's just done um, as, as an incident of the preparation of your evidence. Now it's important because you can then, as you, as you go through, give it to counsel, experts and um, anyone else that needs access to the electronic bundle. And so that bundle is just because it's built upon and is provided at such an early point, it gives everyone an added advantage in trying to get on top of the case and understand the case and develop case theories and so on. Um, so that, yeah, that's what I just, and they're the points I was just making. So you, you, it's built as you go, 
doesn't require any additional work. And when it comes time to prepare the court book at the hearing stage of the, of the proceedings, it's already done um, virtually uh, as an incident of the, the work you've done to prepare the, the evidence. Now, as I said, it's important to deal with this from the outset because um, once you get to a point where you've got multiple exhibits, it, it, it defeats the, pro the, the, the purpose of trying to do it in a cost-effective and efficient manner if you've got, got to go that back and pull things apart and create the court book. You've got to do it from the outset, and that involves talking to your opponent um, and, and agreeing on a way in which the system will operate. And that's what uh, 38 of the, you, you recall, 38 required you to meet prior to the orders being made for evidence. Now, there's nothing new about that. Um, people have been doing uh, electronic discovery for many, many years. Um, parties have been required to meet to agree on protocols for electronic discovery, so uh, it's, it's hardly going to be a difficult um, thing to achieve. And um, in any event, the practice note requires you to do it. So once, if you can get that out of the way quickly, early, agree on the process, how it's going to be done, everything else just falls into place. How you do that, and what, what some ideas about um, what uh, you should do to agree on short minutes and how to achieve that outcome, I'm going to pass on to Richard. He's got um, a proposal that we have been lucky enough to have been given by one of our colleagues, Julie Wright, that has prepared a draft proposed order. I, I should say something about how that came about. Um, last year, a delegation of us from the Greenway <coughs> frog marched up to uh, um, Justice Ball's chambers to um, talk to him about how the practice note might be improved. Uh, and uh, I'm not so sure we got the warmest of welcomes, but in, in any event, one, one of the uh, <laughs> outcomes of that discussion was that uh, his honour asked that we draft what might become a usual order for evidence that his honour could make, or whoever had control of the list on the Fridays could, could make um, uh, at the first directions hearing. Uh, as a way of guiding the process from there on. And um, Julie Wright, uh, on our floor, bless her heart, pre prepared this... Uh... Where are we, Robert? <laughs> I went back. <laughs> oh, so, 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 so she pre prepared what... Uh, we labelled the draft usual order for evidence and it um, provided uh, as follows, that at the commencement of preparation of its evidence in chief, the plaintiffs to prepare a chronological bundle of all documents to be referred to in any affidavit, proposed to be served, and then provided that the evidence can be in hard or electronic copy, and this is important, must identify each document with a unique identifier, and one that, that identifier has to be one that um, doesn't change throughout the life of the case, and uh, must be accompanied by an index which records um, the date, the title date and uni unique identifier of each document. And the idea is that um, the affidavits or the statements will refer to any document that, that's exhibited to those affidavits or statements by their unique identifier. Plaintiff then serves that those affidavits and the bundle on the other parties. And when responding, the defendant likewise defendants, likewise, uh, are required to update the evidence bundle with any additional documents that they want uh, the court to know about, in addition to what's in the plaintiff's bundle, placing them in the correct chronological place, using the same existing, uh, using the existing unique identifiers that the plaintiff has, and, the, well, and hopefully the defendants have collectively agreed is the best approach. Uh, and again, making sure that their witnesses refer to those unique identifiers. And, and you can see by that process that what, what becomes the court book grows um, as the evidence is exchanged. Um, so just going back to paragraphs one and two, which provide for the early steps by the plaintiff, they, they seem to us would be achievable uh, anyway, it's just part of the natural uh, document management that would take place in any litigation. Um, and then 
paragraph three of the proposed order simply um, requires documents that are cited in any affidavit to be uh, referred to by reference to their position in the bundle. Um, None of that, we think, is new. It's um, the electronic discovery and disclosure regime that's been in place for many years has required parties to agree on a protocol for discovery, and it seems to us the same process could be applied to agreeing on a regime for unique document identification in the evidence. Um, and the timetables for, for evidence that most people would, would agree are usually pretty tight so that the time for raising this unique system or this system for uh, the bundle to grow throughout the life of the case, the time we think to raise it with the opponent is um, not after you've served your evidence but early on in the process and after all these, the practice note already says that these things should happen prior to the preparation of a timetable for the serving of evidence. So if people are complying with the practice note and let's face it most of us don't uh, and, and we're rarely pulled up I'm pulled up about it by the court because, uh, well, we can, we can speculate on why none of us are pulled up about it by the court, but um, the, the practice only already contemplates that parties will get together before any evidence is served and indeed um, before the first directions hearing. Um, and then the next paragraphs, the paragraph four and following up, um, uh, we think equally practical that um, once the unique identifier has been adopted, it should be possible for the other parties to fall into line and adopt the same approach. Um, and then proposed order six merely has the effect that it, the regime equally applies to cross claimants and cross defendants. So any party that's involved in the case, no matter their position, has to adopt this system. And then the evidence bundle at the end of it, um, once all the evidence has been served, um, becomes at least part of the court book that one has to prepare anyway for the uh, under the usual order for hearing that already exists. Um, well, that's me. Yeah, yeah. but uh, just one. Uh, 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 we think at the end of that process there will be a chronological bundle that um, can be printed for those who want a hard copy or it'll be available electronically for those who don't and that's um, would have come into being without any additional work on the part of uh, all involved that is additional to what you would already have to subject yourselves to in preparing uh, evidence for trial um, I suppose well, there is one aspect to it that's unique. If, if it's elected, if the option is to go with the electronic uh, version, which would be my, my preference and Ian's preference, and I think an increasingly large number of practitioners prefer it that way, there is some um, utility in trying to thrash out with your counter, your colleagues in the case what naming protocol is going to be given to PDFs, there's nothing more frustrating in an electronic brief than a PDF that's got a title that's longer than the tab. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you've got multiple PDFs open on your screens and all you can see is the case number or something equally useless. If, if the deponent's name is you know, Bill Smith and he swore an affidavit on the 4th of March, you really just need the PDF to be named Smith 4 March and nothing more sophisticated. And that at least shortens the title and allows the PDFs to be spotted at a glance and the bookmarks can mean something rather than uh, what can often happen with these long-winded uh, identifiers. Of, often the, the identifiers are the particular matter number, of, the file, file number of the, of the matter in the solicitor's office, but um, they're not much used to uh, us when we're on our feet trying to find a PDF quickly. <laughs> anyway, over to Ian, I might have stolen some of his thunder there. Oh, no. it's plenty more thunder, don't you worry about that. Um, look, as I said, this is um, the, the court book is the document that we all end up, or the bundle we all end up with when we get to the hearing, and we all use it in a different way. The solicitors, the between solicitors, the experts, counsel, everyone has a different role to play in the litigation. We all use the same bundle differently. For our, from our perspective, we use the bundle obviously to. 
present the case to the court through openings, cross-examination and, and, and submissions and so on. So we all have a different way of doing it, of, of using the bundle. Um, and it's, I think, important for the team to keep one another in the loop and discuss how best to format things like file names and so on. Those sorts of things are easily sorted at an early stage and make life so much easier. Um, so a number of things I think everyone should consider um, as we're proceeding through these steps. The first one is the um, keep everyone in the loop, as I said. Keep the dialogue going. How do you want this done? What's the format of this? How, how big should this bundle be? And so on. Um, document formats and preferences. Um, it, it'll depend on... It'll change from council to council, from solicitor to solicitor. It depends on the app you use, the format, whether it's printed, whether it's electronic. If it's electronic, whether you use PDF Expert or Liquid Text or Good Notes or whatever. All of those things come into play. So just talk to one another and, and just find out what is the best format for that particular council and that particular solicitor and so on. Naming documents, as Richard said, Smith 1721 is great. You just do not need all the other file name, the history of it, whether it's final, semi-final, whatever. Um, we don't need it. You might need it um, for different purposes. But in, when it comes to the court book, it's just not necessary. And if we, particularly if we're using an electronic system, whatever that may be, often they come down the left-hand margin and you can see at a glance that it's Smith or it's a report or blogs or it's a document or whatever of a date. That's all we need. Um, I often go through and change the document names just so I can fit them in the... Um, in the margin of the system that I use. If we can, if you can avoid me having to do that, all power to you, great. <laughs> um, combining or splitting documents. So you're going to have to probably use individual documents uh, at, at the outset so that you can put documents in, at the, in the right chronological spot. Or if you're gonna combine them, you need to be able, the ability, and Adobe can do it easily enough, to split the document, put something in and then recombine it. It's, it's not difficult. Um, you might get a document management uh, professional to do it or you might do it yourselves depending on your level of proficiency with those apps. It's, it is quite easy and we often do it ourselves here um, using the, the Adobe Pro. But you need to think about is this going to be better uh, to have individual PDFs, every document separate, or is it going to be better to have a combined uh, bundle of them in some way as long as you can put the documents in the right spot. So uh, these are things... You, not so much, we're not so much telling you what to do, but saying, think about it. What's the best way of doing it? And it, it may change from case to case. Um, volumes that match the hard copies. Not everyone is doing electronic briefing. If you've got a court book that has 10 volumes, 10 lever arch files, and the court and the judge has got 10 lever arch files, you want your electronic ones to match those electronic, those hard paper, hard copy uh, lever arch files. So if if a, if a lever arch file can fit 500 pages, make the volumes of the electronic brief 500 pages. So that when the judge says, Mr. Roberts, can you just go to the document at page X or volume 10, you can just go to volume 10 and find it easily enough. So that, that's something you want to... It, it also helps when you know somebody comes into a case and needs a copy of the the bundle and they're given a printed copy. It doesn't really matter whether it's printed or electronic now because all the volumes are consistent. Um, volume file sizes. Leave rights files, it's easy because there's a physical space. You can only fit so many bundles in and if you're before Justice Hammerschlag, he'll tell you not to overload it so that the levers and the arches, whatever they call them, don't fit and they all fall apart and then he has a big whinge about there being no tabs and everything's fallen out of his folder. Same for um, electronic versions. If you, if you match the, the leverage file volumes, then you're probably going to be pretty safe. But keep in mind that some documents take up a lot of data. So um, drawings particularly. They might be PDFs, but for some reason drawings are really data intensive. So if you're going to have lots of drawings, lots of colour photos and so on in the folder, you may want to have a smaller folder. There may be... In the old days, you would make the electronic folder match the lever arch folder, but I'd suggest that you ought to now determine the size by the electronic folder and then make the paper one match it. Because you can't, if you overload a volume with drawing colour photos and so on, it becomes a little bit cumbersome. 
if you if you depends on your computer obviously, but if you've got a computer that's not particularly fast, you'll find people are struggling to keep up in court. Um, ensure they're the right way up. Now, that sounds really obvious, doesn't it? But it's all very well getting a leave rights file and turning around. But you know, you see the judge in the court doing this. You want to try and present the evidence in a way that doesn't require a physio to come and give you a massage at the end of the day's play. So it's not hard to turn a drawing around. Even if it's a spreadsheet, um, you can enlarge things on the screen. So don't worry about it being small because it's across the top of the page. You can make them bigger on the screen. But it's so much better having everything oriented the right way. Um, as I said, you might, in a leave right file, put something in that way so you can turn it around. It just doesn't work in electronic. So make the electronic version the control and everything else fits that and you, and you won't go wrong. But just think about that sort of um, problem that can arise. Next thing I want to talk about is what goes in it. Now, I might be showing my age a bit, but when I first started, there were no affidavits, statements or bundles. Um, you called a witness, you took them through their evidence in chief, you asked them a question, you showed them a document, is that it? Yeah, you tender the document. So every document was looked at individually, assessed and determined whether or not it goes into evidence, whether you want to tender it. You, have, you should have the same sort of assessment, even with bundles. Um, ever since the invention of the photocopier, bundles have just grown exponentially in size. You've got to look at documents and see, do I need this? And if I do need it, what am I going to be proving by, by this document? It doesn't need to go in the bundle. And as I say, avoid just dumping everything in there just in case. It's a lot easier to add something if you find it later than give someone a bundle that is so enormous that anything that's relevant is just lost in all the dross that's in there. I was given a court book that was 42 and a half thousand pages long. Probably 500 pages were relevant. Um, and the rest of it was, I mean, there might have been other relevant documents in there, but who'd know? Because it could have been on page 39,482. You, you couldn't find them. So, you, you know, do I need that document in? In the same sort of assessment, should go, um, you should go through the same sort of assessment when you're considering whether to put something in a bundle. Uh, email chains. Uh, they often sort of go on forever, but what is it you want to prove by the document? Is, is there an email where someone said, I accept X, and that's the thing you want in? Do you need that in the response? Do you need the 500-page the chain that just goes on and on and on? Yeah, I'll get back to you, yeah, I'll get back to you. To, you know, that goes forever. I don't know if you know, but when you when you look at a, a long email chain, they get narrower and narrower the further down the chain you go. And in that 42,500 page court book, there were pages that had got so narrow because it was so long that it was a single column of letters. <laughs> That's all that was on the page. And there would be hundreds and hundreds of pages long of that. Just and, it, and it's just taking up, you know, multiple volumes worth of documents. Um, and you can imagine what a judge does when they see that. They just look and go, oh, what am I supposed to do with this? So what do you always think, yourself, what am I trying to prove? What, what, what document do I need to prove that? Do I need the, the end, um, the answer at the end of the email chain? Do I need the document in the middle? In which case, you know, cut that, doc, that, that email out. You might have to put in an affidavit. This is part of an email chain. This is the one I sent on this date, blah, blah, blah. Um, think about whether you can, and if so, how, you would insert documents after the event. We all find documents later in the piece. You know, you'd be preparing at the, at the eve of a trial and someone says, oh, hold on, this isn't in the bundle. Can you put it in? Do you have a format that will allow you to split the document, put something in in the middle of it, in the right chronological spot? And if so, how are you going to do it? That's something that you might want to raise as part of that protocol you're going to deal with right at the outset. Um, and if you can't, supplementary bundles aren't the end of the world. You know, it's far better to have a small supplementary bundle than a massive, um, useless chronological bundle because you just chucked everything in there just in case. Uh, I think people would, uh, judges particularly, and we would much prefer you exercise um, some discretion about it and then say, okay, I can't justify this document going in. If later on it becomes relevant because you think, oh, I didn't realise that issue was 
in play. I will have to put that document in. And sure, okay, you might have to put a supplementary bundle in. That's far better than having 42,500 pages, believe me. Um, now, what emerges from all of this, I think, is that if you approach the requirements of the practice note at the outset, if you have the meeting that paragraph 38 requires, if you agree on how you're going to do it and you serve your evidence with the bundle that then grows, once you get that first step in place, everything else follows. There's very little additional work you need to do to tweak the system. Um, it becomes a much cheaper exercise. The clients don't have to pay for multiple copies, pulling things apart, putting them together. You can get your, your, your court book prepared early. You can get it to council. You can get it to experts. Everyone's dealing with the same page numbers and so on. So all of that um, is designed, if you can get that right at the beginning, everything else is designed to flow from there. Now, just one other thing. The practice note that we've been rambling on about has all these you know, wonderful requirements that you agree on bundles and you electronic bundles that are built up and everything like that. That's been in place for more than 15 years. It's not new. No one uses it. And and I've even had solicitors who I've said, why don't we do it? And they go, yeah, great idea. But then they don't do it. And when you ask why, they go, well, oh, it's just the way we do it. You know? So, as I said, you always have to, every time you run a case, and well, at least every time we run a case, I'm sure you guys are the same. When you run a case, you always go back and think, is there a better way that I could have done that? Uh, you know, could I cross-examine this person differently? Could I put this bundle together differently? Whatever. Always self-analyse the, um, the way in which you've run the case and you can nine times out of ten find something that you can do better. And this is one of those things. You go back and say, had I known about that or had I approached that, I wouldn't have had to have, wouldn't have had all the problems with the court book. Would, the council would have had the documents earlier. The preparation would have been better. Everything else... Um, it's it's a happier world. So that's that's sort of the, the theme of tonight. Get things done early, uh, uh, cost effectively, efficiently, and, and you will put yourself in a far better position to run the case and your client will be far better um, um, armoured to, to win. So I think um, that's really the thing that I, we'd like you to take away from today. Is there anything else you want to add? Only, I've got an appeal tomorrow in one of those cladding cases, combustible cladding cases, and, uh, and I'm looking through the appeal book indexes and there's all these references to documents that were adduced below or tended below, not not, repeat, not repeated in the appeal books and uh, as being irrelevant to the appeal. And so, some of them include... Well, this is a case in which we agreed quantum, so the only issue was liability, and yet the trial judge, I notice, was burdened with... Uh, three quantity surveying reports going to quantum and render thousands of pages because they were itemised bills of quantities at the back of the report in the usual way. And I was reflecting on why on earth we would have burdened the trial judge with that in circumstances where we'd agreed quantum, but it's just an example of the court, court, court book getting thrown together with everything that's been served without any sort of anybody taking a moment to step back from it to work out whether we actually need this stuff, including me. <laughs> well, another thing you can do, um, and I'm only sort of suggesting this as a, um, an idea in some trials, it's always going to work. You, you might have a number of documents in the chronological bundle that's built up over the course of the case, but everyone gets more familiar with the issues, it's fine-tuned, It's every, everyone's focusing on the real issues in dispute by the time you get to the, um, the hearing. And if you do it the way that we propose, you're far better equipped to identify at, in that large chronological bundle the really important documents within that and just say, let's just put that in as the exhibit, leave the, the, the rest of it out if it's if you think it's not really needed. Um, you know, I've often, you've had cases where you turn up to court where there have been volumes and volumes and volumes lining the walls and someone could come in with a small little manila file and say, really, that's the only bundle of documents that matter in this case. And it's a bit like if I had more time, I'd write a shorter letter. <laughs> So I think the, the further into a case you get, the more familiar you are with the issues, the, the fewer the documents that really matter are, and you can, you can identify them much more quickly. And if there are fewer documents, it's a lot easier to run a case. <laughs> so. I suppose the other point, though, is that we're 
in some ways victims of the foibles of the trial judge that we yeah. allocated it. I recently had a matter that was to start on the Monday. On the Friday, there was a pre-trial directions hearing called by the judge, and I sort of triumph triumphantly informed his honour that we had prepared this court book uh, that we were organising to get up to him, uh, and I told him that we, you know, stripped it of all dividers and tabs. It was all just a sequential bundle of paginated documents, which was my preference. And he looked at me <laughs> with a face of stone and said, "I want the tabs. I want the dividers." So we had to <laughs> go back and retrofit this bloody folder with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was hoping he was going to accept an electronic copy and I, could, I couldn't get him to agree to that. So he wanted a hard copy and I had to, yeah. his solicitors had to retrofit it all. <laughs> well, we don't have a docket system. It's sort of one of the disadvantages, isn't it? I mean, if you know who your judge is, and every, every judge has a different way of dealing with it. If you know who your judge is early, you can roll up and say, this is what we propose. In fact, if you can find out who your judge is, even in the, the week or two before the hearing. It's not a bad idea to, to contact the associate and say, can we come up and tell his honour, her honour, whoever, what we're proposing to do, rather than, as poor old Richard had, <laughs> Friday before the Monday start. But if you can find out who your judge is and go up there and say, um, you know, we've been dutifully preparing this case and this is where we are and what we're doing, and if you've got a couple of weeks uh, and they want you to go off and do something else, you've got time. So without, you know, causing too much heartache. Um, I think, is there anything else? Has anyone got any questions or want to add to anything we've said? Yes. What, what you said, it sounds like this process is usually left to the last minute, but what you're proposing is that it's done earlier and along the way. Um, so presumably the costs then aren't going to be different at the end. Um, do you have any experience or do you know how cost assessors treat this if this gets done earlier in the process rather than... Well, there are two things. First, it, it will... It, it's not a case of moving the cost from the end to the beginning because if you do what the practice note requires and create a single common bundle that builds up, you don't then have to create the chrono bundle in, so you save that cost. So that pulling apart of exhibits and everything and the flurry of activity right at the end of the case, just before the hearing, is not necessary. Um, it also produces a far better outcome because it naturally controls the number of duplication, the amount of duplication in the bundle. You don't have 10 copies of the, of the contract and the space and the, this report and that report and everything. You've just got the documents as they go. So it, it's far less expensive for the client because you're not duplicating and creating that that, that exercise at the end. I don't have experience with cost assessors and how they would treat it, but I suspect it would be you'd be better armed if you had complied with the practice note than if you hadn't. The practice note 35, the paragraph 35 in the practice note has an out that says, unless the court orders otherwise, all the parties agree. Parties never agree. They just get given a bundle of documents and they go off and they prepare their own evidence and so on. No one even thinks about it. Um, but if you were to say, we are required to meet, here is the agreement, everyone agrees on a way, on a way forward, and you produce the sort of common bundle that the practice note requires, and let's say you win the case as the plaintiff or whatever, and you want your costs of preparing that bundle, for a start it's going to be less, as I said, than if you did it the other way. But how would a, a cost assessor exercising his or her power reject the costs of preparing that bundle if it were done precisely in accordance with the practice note? I, I, I can't imagine you'd miss out on that. No, you may actually miss out on if you do it the old way and not do it in accordance with the practice note, thereby increasing the costs, wasting costs, and having, uh, and, and having to then try and justify the additional costs because you didn't comply with the note. So I think you'd be better placed to comply. But as I said, Julie Wright actually, who prepared the the usual order for evidence, is a cost assessor. Um, we may infer in that that <laughs> uh, if she considers that would be a a, a good way forward if, uh, in terms of cost assessment. But yeah, that's about as far as I could take it. Anyone else? You know, I've seen, in, I've used electronic court books, but in bigger money cases where each page has a unique identity. Yeah. Um, 
And how do you see the, so you, you've got a document of unique identifier, say the contract is document X, and then you've got a pinpoint reference to page 60 of the contract in the affidavit. Do you see that, is, is there a way of making that work? Do you, do, you, do you have to give each page an identifier to make it flexible within the electronic core book? Um, or uh, does it work by having a document identifier and then just a, a reference to some page number, which I assume has to be within that document rather than the core Yeah, book. I think it's courses for courses. If you had a document that had a, an identifier, if you can identify the document. So what, the purpose of having a document identifier is so when a witness says the contract, blah, 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 they know which document to go to in that bundle. And if it's identified by reference to a discovery number or some sort of identifier, then they find the document. If the document itself has page numbers, there's no difficulty saying page 220 of the contract, which is bracket, document, identifier, whatever, close bracket, you'll still identify the document. If, if it's a case where there are identifiers for every page, you could equally in the affidavit refer to the pages identified. I don't think it really matters which you adopt as long as you work out at the outset what you're going to do. I'd say if you look at the AS4902 contract, it's all the annexure part A to yep. the part whatever, ZZ, ZZ. Um, now that each part is separately enumerated, yeah. separately paginated, so uh, you really do need some system to, to put in place to identify the particular page in the 500 page document and with all its annexures. Yeah. So, well, but even if even if they let's take that example, even if they are separately numbered, what's wrong with saying in the contract identifier X, and an extra part A identifier Y, and page ten item thirteen, you're still identifying. You need to be able to take the judge to whatever you're looking at fairly quickly. Oh yeah, sure. Um, but worse than being in the case, particularly when you've got multiple parties. And the, half yeah. a dozen barristers on each for each party. But don't forget that the people the start looking at the wrong page. Yeah, sure. But don't forget the the purpose of the identifier is is more for the evidence, so that the witness in their affidavit can can identify the particular document that they're putting in evidence and they're referring to in the affidavit. Once you get to court and you've got the the court book and it's all completed as a consequence of following this this process, you you can have an automatic uh, Adobe numbering system that then gives you a a page number from, you know, volume one, one to five hundred, volume two, five hundred, one to a thousand, and so on. So you've got the ability to do that additionally. But I think the the way forward is to, it's to factor all that into that initial discussion. How are we going to number the pages? We we know the documents involve a, a, um, a particular standard form contract. We know it involves multiple um, financial documents, each of which have their own unique number. So how are we going to do it? That's that's what you need to sort out the outcome. It's, I don't think it's all that difficult, but if you get it done, if, if you if you agree on that at the beginning, it becomes a lot easier down the track. And and just remember that the purpose of that first numbering system is so that a witness, when they refer to it, and there's no question about what they're referring to, when you get into court, you've got the document that you can take the judge to by reference to page, paragraph, and item, or whatever. Just wondering, um, if if one side seeks to agree with the other side on the approach to in the practice note, and the other side rejects it or, or doesn't kind of um, respond, is there utility in seeking to have an undetermined uh, under directions hearing, or yeah, or trying to force the issue, I suppose, or do you really kind of need the other side to play ball on it? Well, it's, it's that's a sort of question would apply to any dispute in those um, stages of the litigation. Some people sort of. You know, you might fight about discovery categories or particulars, all those sorts of things that judges just hate having brought before them. If you can agree, they'll be forever grateful. If you can't and you're forced, then you might have to make an application or raise it in a directions hearing. I mean, you'd want to try and... You'd, you'd think that practitioners acting sensibly could agree on things like this. It's no different to agreeing on discovery protocols and things like that. Which Doesn't always happen, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, um, with anything, if you if you were to march up to a, a judge and say, "There's five parties in this case. Four of us have agreed on this. We've got one outlier whose whose position is X." It's pretty quickly going to become apparent that that outlier is adopting an unreasonable attitude and 
will probably be brought under line. But look, you, you, you can't predict how those sorts of things would play out because you just don't know what the reasons are and the circumstances of the case. But you'd think that, you'd hope that practitioners could agree on something as simple as that. And it's, look, it's for everyone's benefit. And it's going to, I, I think what ultimately it'll, it may well be driven by clients who just say, oh, you know, the cost of pulling all this apart and creating these things at the end, contrary to what the practice note requires and has required for 15 years or more, um, it's difficult to justify. So, and if you can do it more cheaply, then you'll be more competitive and, and so on. Anyone else? Yep. Just, um, probably a practical question, but when you're when the witness swears their affidavit, um, is it a situation that you would still need a bundle for that witness to swear to, or are they just swearing that they've seen the relevant documents on the PM? Yeah. Look, I we we had this discussion with Justice Ball when we went up. Um, my own view is that if there's an index to the bundle, it's easy for the plaintiff because first witness, all their evidence are in the bundle and they can do that quite easily. Thereafter, the witnesses could swear the um, or, or refer to uh, the exhibits by the identifiers so that there'll be an index and identify the, the documents um, as they go through and deal with the documents from the bundle. Or they could arguably do it... Um, in Globo by reference to their own index of those documents that they're going to refer to in their affidavit. Um, but there are probably a number of ways of doing it. Anyone else? Do you think the real change will come with when the bench starts using electronic court books a bit more? I mean, yeah, it could do. Mostly the bar table people are using you know, electronic formats, but it's it's that contest from electronic to paper that just causes yeah. chaos as well. Yeah. Well, it's probably right. I mean, I, Rich has probably got the same experience, but I, I've been in, in hearings where you're constantly waiting for the judge to catch up because they're sort of ruffling through folders and you're already there because you hit a hyperlink. Um, and they often look at you and go, oh, yeah. how did you get this so quickly <laughs> from time to time? And, and there are judges who are adopting uh, um, electronic briefing. I mean, Justice Goodman from our floor... Um, He's a, a big fan of liquid text, for example. I mean, that, that's a system that you could send the court book up in that form with all the links embedded in it um, so that he just reads the submission and just clicks on the, on the link each time and takes a pinpoint spot in the, in the bundle. So, but there are other systems that are similar. If you, um, if you agree on, a, on the use of a particular app at the beginning, then there's no reason why you couldn't send up a fully linked court book. The delay is particularly, I think, evident in the Court of Appeal with the with the coloured appeal books. I had an appeal recently with five five judges sitting, and and I had it all electronically linked. So every time I wanted to go to a particular coloured book and page number in that book, I was able to do it by touching on a link on the screen screens in front of me, and then I had to wait while five judges independently turned it up. Mm. Yeah, it would be a great leap forward, I think, when when the bench is. I think that's a while away, to be honest. I don't want to say a while, it might be you know, five years or, yeah. or more. But the fact that they're the judge may be a bit slower shouldn't stop us from putting in place these types of protocols because it just makes you so much quicker. And, and if you can get the document more quickly, you've just got time to think, you've got time to look at it and go, oh, hold on, that doesn't say what I thought. Yeah. Might need an authority. You know, it, it just gives you that um, little bit of a head start over everyone who's pulling out lever arch folders. I mean, I remember when I first thought there's got to be a better way, actually I was in a case against you. And I reckon I just about had to have shoulder surgery afterwards, just reaching around getting lever arch folders, you know, for one after the other for weeks at a time. I could barely move my shoulder by the end of it. And I thought, you know, but we didn't have the technology then. I think no. iPad Pros and so on were really the game changers that allowed us to look at doing it more efficiently um, electronically. But certainly there's, there's enough tech around at the moment to do it, but as I said, look, all these things that we've been talking about, they're not only applicable to electronic briefing. It's certainly better, we think, and we use it a lot. But if you want to print it or power to you, that's fine. Um, it's it, it's more a case of getting to the point where it's it's there, ready to print or ready to use electronically, whichever is your preference. That's that's the real 
uh, the trick, you know, doing it in a way that's inexpensive and much more, um, it results in a better outcome for you as the person having to run the case, you know. Any more questions, comments? We've got drinks, I think. I think we have drinks, so we might adjourn to the other area and and um, have, a, have a, a nibble and a drink. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you.